Welcome to Building Resilience, Drought and Flood in the Russian River Watershed. My name is Carrie Winninger with Sonoma State University's Center for Environmental Inquiry, and I will be your technical support today. So if at any time you have a problem, go ahead and send me a private message in the chat and we'll figure it out that way. So the agenda for today um, includes a short introduction by the Center for Environmental Inquiry team and our moderator, Kristen Cushman, followed by presentations from our featured speakers. We will then move into an audience discussion and then wrap up with opportunities for action. Here are some technical guidelines for the event. You're in a Zoom meeting, not a webinar, and as such, you have control over your own video and audio. Please keep yourself muted except during the discussion. And during that part, we actually highly encourage you to speak up out loud. You don't have to put things in the chat. You can raise your hand, you can speak up. We'd like it to be an out loud conversation. Uh, in the meantime, you can use the chat as much as you would like for questions, comments, and technical help. Uh, the event is being recorded, and we also ask that you take a moment to type your full name and your affiliation into the chat right now. It's our sign-in sheet for the day, and we really appreciate that. Uh, the chat is also where you can ask questions and make comments during the presentations. And with that, I will turn it over to the Director of the Center for Environmental Inquiry, Claudia Loop. Welcome to the 2021-22 Building Resilience Series of North Bay Forward. This is the first lunch in a year-long series that's focused on ways we can work together to enhance resilience to climate change in our region. So as Carrie mentioned, I'm Claudia Luke. I'm the director of Sonoma State Center for Environmental Inquiry and also Sonoma State's Sustainability Programs Director. So now for those of you who may be new uh, North Bay Forward uh, is a collaborative initiative to host discussions that are focused on ways to increase collaborations surrounding sustainability and resilience. So as Carrie mentioned, we invite speakers to highlight best practices of what's going on in our region and raise awareness about that. And then our discussions are really focused on ways that we can best support those efforts or expand on those efforts through collaboration. So um, if any of you would like to be more involved with developing these North Bay Forward events, please let us know. We're still in the process of um, uh, finding speakers for many of the topics that are coming up. And Carrie will be um, reminding us about upcoming uh, events at the end of this um, discussion. So um, just from a Sonoma State's perspective, this series is very important. Um, Sonoma State is committed to creating and implementing a climate action plan that will be done in April of this coming year. And it includes not only carbon neutrality, but also ways that SSU can collaborate to enhance regional resilience. So this series is an opportunity for SSU to explore those um, initiatives through the folks who are attending. Um, and that's about it. I would just like to thank the Regional Resilience Working Group, um, which is part of SSU's President's Sustainability Advisory Council um, for helping to plan and host these events. And many of them are here today. And I just wanted to mention their names. Molly Clemens is our student representative, uh, Kimberly Cato Alvarez, Kendra Couts, I saw just joined, um, Kristen Cushman, of course, Carrie, uh, Tanya Nareth and uh, Barbara Froelich. So thank you all for, for that, um, for your effort in pulling this together. So now I would like to turn it over to Kristen Cushman. Kristen is the CEO of EcoShift and she is working with SSU on the development and implementation of our climate action plan. So she's gonna be introducing today's topic and our speakers and moderating our discussion. So over to you, Kristen. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Again, my name is Kristen and I'll be moderating this series throughout the year. And I'm very excited to be participating in the climate action planning process on campus. Um, part of that though, is to build their resiliency uh, framing around that. And so, you might be hearing from me from time to time. I'd love to figure out pathways and, and partnerships that could help support SSU uh, moving forward, as well as how can SSU help you all in the projects that you're doing. 
So two, there are two key elements to resilience that I wanted to call out. Um, one is, as what we're talking about, collaboration, and the other is authentic representation. And that's why we're here today. As stakeholders in the region, it's important for all of us to work together and share the resources that we have to ensure that all of our sectors in the community are represented in the discussion. Uh, so with that, I, I can kind of see the chat box, but I did make a little list here uh, of people who did register. These are not individual community members, although there are quite a few here today as well as students. Um, but the agencies and organizations that um, have participated in some dialogue with me or have registered are uh, Bay Nature Institute, Four Leaf, the Town of Windsor, Pepperwood, El Cerrito Community Garden Network, uh, Fairfield Osborne Preserve, Laguna de Santa Rosa Foundation, Sonoma Land Watch, Sonoma County Regional Climate Protection Authority, Regener Regenerative uh, Vines, Petaluma Wetlands Alliance, Mariposa County Master Gardeners, Sonoma Water, and Latina Services Providers. And so if I missed anyone, um, and as, as Carrie said, please put your name in the chat so that we can follow up with you or, or um, you know, include you on further conversations. Um, and then, of course, there'll be a, a Q&A at the end of this that um, we'll get to know you a little bit better. So let me start by providing an overview of our discussion around drought and flood in the Russian uh, watershed. And as you are all aware, uh, California is experiencing a drought. And we, uh, when you combine that with the unprecedented storms that climate change is causing, this is bringing in a lot of potential flooding. And so to approach solutions, we need to consider uh, what we're calling today an integrated water management system. And I wanted to just give you kind of an overview of what, uh, what that means. An integrated waste uh, water management system is a collaborative effort to identify and implement water management solutions on a regional scale to uh, increase resilience, uh, to reduce risk and manage water, thinking about the social, environmental and economic objectives. So uh, these objectives include water quality, better flood management, restored enhanced ecosystems and more reliable surface and ground water supplies. And equally important are the communities that are greatly affected when drought and flooding occur. So we need to consider the impacts that we have on the floods have on farmers and landowners and and even the disadvantaged uh, parts of our county. But then, as I, I think Don said in an earlier conversation, we should not forget the fish and the diverse wildlife that rely on healthy and regenerative water supplies. And so this, that framing makes this, dis this discussion today really important. We wanna learn what projects exist and then figure out how we can all work together to improve those projects or replicate that work. So water users, planners, um, landowners, they must collectively plan and adapt the water system in a proactive way. And we want to ensure that those systems are also uh, resilient to the changing conditions um, that are facing us. And so with that, I want to introduce our speakers. Uh, we have two today, as you saw on the agenda. The first, uh, we have Mary Grace Pawson. She's the Director of Development Services for the City of Rohnert Park. And she's going to be talking about a very unique project uh, that um, I think SSU is, is very interested in, Copeland Creek Repairing and Enhancement Project and the impacts that that's having on groundwater um, and flooding and habitat. And then we have Don Seymour. He's the Principal Water Agency Engineer uh, for Sonoma County. And he's also got a very exciting new technology that he's going to talk about called Firo and the effects that that's having on managing water supplies um, and forecasts. So I will turn the mic over to Mary. Thanks, Kristen. And I'm going to take just a minute to share my screen here. Um, Laura Park is really delighted to have the opportunity to share this project with all of you. It's something that's been in development here for over a decade um, and is, is beginning to look like um, a concept that we may be able to implement in the next four or five years. So bear with me just a second. 
and uh, we should be good to go. Um, well, we're going to be here. <laughs> so, you know, first, right off the bat, why would anyone consider a detention basin on Copeland Creek? Um, this first graphic here illustrates basically the upper Copeland Creek and Hindball watersheds. Um, Petaluma Hill Road is running north-south um, about two-thirds of the way across the screen. You can see Sonoma State University, and you can see Copeland Creek coming out of the foothills of Sonoma Mountain. Um, and in its flood stage, um, spreading to join Hindball Creek. Um, and Mary, moving, Mary, may I interrupt you real quick? Um, in the chat, they've asked that you put it in present uh, presentation mode. Is that possible to make it a little bit bigger? Let me see. Um, I think you can start from the beginning. Yeah. There we go. Does that? Yeah, pretty. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and let me go back. Um, yeah, again, this particular graphic was produced by a team of hydraulic modelers that are working with um, Sonoma Water in partnership on this project. And it really illustrates the behavior of Copeland and then Hindball Creek. Um, under our best understanding of 100 year hydrology right now in time, um, and in an unconstrained setting. Um, and, and you can see that we really sit at the foot of the mountains. We are on a historic alluvial fan. Um, when the creek experiences peak rainfall events, um, really our series of creeks interact with one another. Copeland and Heinbaugh um, feed one another. And there are pretty dramatic impacts across the community with respect to flooding. Um, we have seen events close to this once in the past 25 years. Um, it does close the Sonoma State University campus. It closes a number of streets in Rona Park. Um, it does not at this point in time flood structures. Um, but one of our concerns in a changing climate is that our best understanding of the 100 year rainfall today may be our best understanding of the 50 year rainfall tomorrow. And when we look at um, planning for the resiliency of the city, um, having some type of flood protection on Copeland Creek could be particularly beneficial to the community of Rona Park, the SSU community, and potentially into Katati and, and even into the Petaluma uh, River watershed. Rona Park and Copeland Creek are far enough south in the Russian River watershed um, that there's a pretty healthy argument as to whether or not uh, Copeland Creek interacts with Lehigh Creek under certain types of flood events. And we actually see water moving between the Petaluma and the Russian River watersheds. So big picture, this is what caused the city and frankly, Sonoma Water to begin to consider a detention basin on Copeland Creek. Uh, the second motivator, this is a close up of our university district development. For those of you familiar with Roner Park, again, Petaluma Hill Road is to the right. Roner Park Expressway is near the bottom of the slide. Sonoma State University is uh, just below Roner Park Expressway. And the city working with Brookfield Homes is in the process of developing a 1600 home subdivision that includes over 200 affordable housing units. Um, the subdivision is in the floodplain of Copeland Creek. The developer's solution to that has been a detention basin, which you can see in the lower left-hand portion of the site. It's been effective at moving their development out of the floodplain, but it occupies a piece of property that could be developed with 200 more housing units. So there, there is some interest from the private market in seeing a detention basin solution, again, moved east of Petaluma Hill Road. There are a number of benefits of the basin, again, a number of which we've developed in partnership with Sonoma Water. The first and most obvious one is flood control. 
Um, the second benefit is groundwater recharge. The majority of the recharge of the groundwater basin um, in Roner Park, in this part of the Santa Rosa Plain Basin, comes through the gravelly creek channels. So to the extent that we can detain runoff for a period of time and release it slowly after peak rainfall events, we can maximize the amount of groundwater that, or the amount of, of floodwaters that move through the creek channels and maximize groundwater recharge. The project has a significant sediment management benefit. Um, runoff of Sonoma Mountain brings a lot of sediment into Rona Parks Creeks, into the Laguna de Santa Rosa, where it contributes to an impaired condition. Um, and the ability to catch sediment further upstream before it makes its way into the Laguna ecosystem has, has a number of benefits for um, both maintaining channel integrity and, and reducing uh, pollutants in the watershed. The project has the potential to enhance habitat. Um, a properly constructed project um, with a well-designed incised floodplain for Copeland Creek um, actually has the opportunity to shelter um, some on its species when they move upstream. And finally, and, and, you know, I usually talk about this project in the environmental context, and, and I think this is the environmental and equity context, but the ability to support housing construction within the city's urban growth boundary, well, we've all decided as a county um, housing should go, um, it is a benefit, minimizes sprawl, helps us reduce vehicle miles to travel and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, and really allows the property that we've planned um, to be in the urban environment, be used in the urban environment. The basin as we're proposing it is east of Petaluma Hill Road, really directly east of Petaluma Hill Road. And um, if you're familiar again with the campus, it, it lines up pretty closely with um, Oh, with the, with the ball fields there. The detention basin would be a 90 to 120 acre foot facility as it's scoped. And again, it, it would include some enhancements and reconstruction of the Copeland Creek floodplain to better support riparian habitat, um, sediment catch, catchment and, and fish habitat. So the history of this concept, it, it began in 2006 and it was included in the city's public facilities finance plan as something that we thought we needed to support plan build out of the city. In 2012, um, the project got just a huge assist from Sonoma Water. Um, their very talented grant writing team was able to secure um, an integrated resource water management planning grant from the Department of water resources that allowed us to conduct a series of technical studies on the flood control feasibility, the groundwater recharge feasibility, the sediment control feasibility, and the habitat enhancement feasibility. Um, that basis of design report was delivered in 2016 and, and really proved the concept across the board. Um, while the basin was I guess I'll say less effective from a groundwater recharge standpoint than everyone originally hoped because of the underlying clay soils and the need to really get water back in the creeks to get the recharge benefit. Um, we were able to document that there is some recharge benefit if the basins operated properly. Um, the city followed up the 2016 grant with a series of more focused technical studies. And those are the illustrations you saw early in the presentation. Those studies really, again, in partnership with Sonoma Water, drilled into some ongoing questions about, are we using the right hydrology? Have we properly characterized, particularly the topography of the upper watershed? Do we understand the interaction of Copeland, Heinbaugh, and Lehigh Creeks? I think at this point, I can tell you we understand the interaction of Copeland and Heinbaugh and people are still working on the interaction with Lehigh Creek. Um, 
And it really provided us with the technical detail to apply for a construction grant from the Federal Emergency Management Associate Agency, which we um, received notice we were awarded just two weeks ago, 2022 projects in the country that, that has received funding from FEMA. The challenge with this project is, is done properly. It's a 12 to $18 million project. Um, and, it, and it will require some outside assistance to be financially feasible for the stakeholders. So our next steps and challenges as, as, as for bringing this project forward. While we have completed a basis of design report and we have circulated a notice of preparation for an environmental document, we have not completed detailed CEQA and NEPA documentation. And, and that will be a significant task. Um, the proposed site of the basin does have wetland resources. It's part of the reason it's so functional um, as a potential detention basin site. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Copeland Creek is also host to Salmonids, so construction related activity will have some permitting complexity. Um, and the resource agency permitting is a, a task that we're going to need to work through carefully, um, thoughtfully, and in partnership with a wide range of stakeholders in order for it to be successful. And, and then finally, there is and remains the challenging of the, the, the challenge of the funding partnerships. Um, we are, as a, a city, extremely grateful for um, the opportunity to work with FEMA to fund this project. We expect a significant contribution from the benefiting private developer towards the cost of construction. And we'll continue to work with Sonoma Water um, on how to best implement this project in light of their responsibilities to both the Russian River watershed and the Petaluma River watershed from a flood control standpoint. Um, so that's that's really where we are with this project today. It's it's at a really exciting point, um, ready to move forward into the next step of, of implementation. Um, and again, I'm really pleased to be on the panel with Sonoma Water because a great deal of the credit for bringing the project this far um, really belongs to um, the talent of their staff and the great partnership we've had working with them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. There was a couple of questions that came through the chat. I think uh, just if you could answer them, Mary, in, in, in just a real short um, frame. What can you just, what was the stakeholder engagement process? What did it look like or what will it look like? And, and specifically, uh, are you planning to engage with the tribes at all? Yeah, you know, we, we are in consultation with the tribe on this project. We began the consultation in 2016 when we circulated our initial notice of preparation. Um, the consultations are confidential. Um, this is an important and sensitive site to the tribe um, yeah. as, as it is to, to many, many stakeholders in, in the Russian River watershed. Um, we, we are at the beginning of our consultation process. We, we did some initial public outreach um, when we circulated our notice of preparation. We have built a mailing list of stakeholders. Um, the project took a little bit of a hiatus while we tried to figure out, can we even build this thing? Um, and the effort in waking back up the CEQA, CEQA and NEPA process will include community dialogue. There's just no way it can. not yeah, great. Thank you. All right. I see that there's some more uh, questions coming through. So we'll try to answer your questions. Um, but I want to make sure that we have enough time for Don. And if we don't get to every single question that's coming through, we can follow up via email if you'd like as well. So Don, let me pass it off to you. And you also have an exciting new development to share. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And just give me a moment to, to bring up a few slides and I'll get going. Can everybody see that okay? All right. So um, kind of what is forecast? What I'm, what I'm gonna be presenting today is, is uh, referred to as FIRO, but it, what it, FIRO stands for is Forecast Informed Reservoir Operations. And what it is, is informing reservoir managers, particularly 
that are in charge of flood control operations using um, advanced um, forecasting that's been developed over the last decade or so, you know, prior to when many, many reservoirs were constructed, you know, like, for example, I'm going to be focused on Lake Mendocino today. Lake Mendocino was constructed in the, in the late 1950s when, you know, forecasting skill was, you know, far from what it is today. And um, I want to focus on the fact that Zero is, it, 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 it's, it's very exciting. It's, it, it's being um, considered uh, in applications in other parts of the state. As a matter of fact, it's being um, evaluated at Prado Dam down in Orange County and also at uh, Lake Oroville and Bullard's Bar on the uh, Yuba Feather River. But you know what works at Lake Mendocino um, is not going to necessarily work at another site. You know each site has to be evaluated for a specific um, watershed uh, and reservoir characteristics and constraints. So I also want to, um, you know, uh, this this effort um, wasn't just by Sonoma Water, and it wouldn't be as effective and um, as it is today. Um, if it hadn't been this partnership of a number of agencies, both state and federal, that are um, involved in the Russian River watershed. And so this includes not only Sonoma Water, but also um, several line offices of the Army Corps of Engineers, USGS, um, the um, Center for Western Weather uh, Water Extremes, or in short, CW3E. Um, which is in, uh, down at Scripps Institute, Institute of Oceanography, Bureau of Re uh, Reclamation, Department of Water Resources, and several line offices of uh, NOAA, including the National Marine Fisheries and uh, the National Weather Service. You know, without this, this consensus group of, of, of agencies that have really um, a stake in the Russian River watershed, this, this really wouldn't, have, wouldn't be happening. And so kind of what is the concept of uh, of, of forecasting for reservoir operations and, and why is it important to Lake Mendocino? Lake Mendocino is really where the whole, the whole idea of it started. And what this figure is, is the rule, is the flood control rule curve for Lake Mendocino. Everything below that, that, that dashed line in that shaded area is the water supply pool. And um, when, when the storage is in the water supply, when the lake level is in the water supply pool, Sonoma Water controls reservoir releases for minimum stream flow requirements and downstream demands. But when uh, the water elevation in the, in the reservoir goes above that rule curve, that's in the flood control pool. And that's under the management of the Army Corps of Engineers for uh, dam safety and, and protecting um, folks from downstream flooding. And so, as you can see, it's variable. In the, in the winter, it's down at about 68,400 acre feet, but in March, it starts increasing uh, to 111,000 acre feet in May, and that that's reflective of the fact that you know big storm events and uh, the risk of flooding is decreasing, and, and they're leveraging that to maximize the water supply pool. But unfortunately, you know we don't because that risk is decreasing of flooding. It's because of not having large storm events. It's really difficult that you to, to um, leverage that 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 space, and that was actually masked. For, for decades because of um, a hydroelectric project, which you're probably familiar with, the Potter Valley project that's owned and operated by Pacific Gas and Electric. And it transfers Eel River water from the, it transfers Eel River water through the project where it's discharged in the East Branch of Russian River and much of it uh, makes its way into uh, Lake Mendocino. But in 2006, their FERC license was amended that drastically changed how much water was being transferred through the project. And specifically, it changed it starting at that March time frame. And so water that used to be coming in and would actually fill the reservoir has now been really constrained. And the reservoir has become much more dependent on these uh, late spring events, which frequently we don't see. And so the idea is, can we create this special thero pool of water in the flood control pool, recognizing it's a higher risk water than what's in the water supply pool. And if we can do that, we can retain that water to hopefully offset issues with the Potter Valley project, but broader issues too, you know, climate change, land use changes that have occurred in the watershed, 
listing of uh, three species, salmon species, steelhead, Chinook and coho. And, you know, how can we leverage that water to benefit, you know, the needs of the system? But recognizing it's higher risk, we need to have additional tools that um, can provide flood, uh, the, the flood managers uh, information on, on when they need to, you know, when they can retain it and when it might need to be evacuated so we don't reduce the flood protection that the reservoir um, currently has. And so I, the, I'm showing these three slides. These, these are a whole presentation in themselves, but it's just to exemplify really the advancements in, um, in, in forecasting tools that have been developed and how they're being leveraged for this project. And so that, that, that first little box, it's referred to a, a, as an ensemble of rain forecasts over a 15 day period. It's the cumulative rainfall. And as you can see, there's, there's, there's actually 64 different traces. And each one of those traces is a different member, or you can think of as a different outcome. And the envelope it creates is really the, 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 the different outcomes that could happen over the next 15 days. And, and, it, it's, it, it, and, and you should think of it as an envelope. And that feeds into inflow forecasts to the reservoir. And again, there are 64 um, different traces in that ensemble. And, and again, they all represent different outcomes that could occur over the next 15 days. And as you can see in the early part, the first few days, you know, the traces are all together, but as, you, as, as the traces go out the full 15 days, they, you, they begin to separate and the envelope becomes much wider. And that's just recognizing the uncertainty as you go further out. There's more skill in the, in, in the forecast in, in the first three to seven days. And as you get, start getting past seven days, that, that skill starts to uh, decline. And then lastly, um, this last box rep represents actually a model that was de developed by Chris Delaney, uh, an en engineer at Sonoma County Water Agency, who um, uses that information to develop a risk forecast for the reservoir. And that's compared to, that's the red, that's that red line, and each of those uh, dots represent the day. And, you, and then the blue line is actually a risk threshold. And it's the, the, the risk forecast is compared to that risk threshold. And if if, if that risk threshold is being exceeded by the, by the forecast, then the, this model makes, provides a, a recommendation to the reservoir operator on a release they might want to consider, along with all the other tools that, that the Army Corps uses for making those decisions. But it gives the Army Corps an additional tool to make that decision. And, and along with, with what I'm showing you here, um, the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes has also developed a, a number of advanced um, uh, forecasting products, really specifically geared toward, towards atmos atmospheric rivers, which are the big events in our area that, 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 that can bust a drought, but they can also create flooding. Uh, so those are the events that, as a, as a water manager, I like to see because they fill our reservoirs, but the uh, reservoir, the, the dam operator for flood control operations, is concerned, particularly if they have water, that we're retaining water in that in that bureau pool. And just a little background on, on the Russian River watershed. So there's two large reservoirs that Sonoma Water um, maintain, operates uh, uh, cooperatively with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, they're both dual purpose. Uh, Lake Mendocino, which is a few miles northeast of the city of Ukiah, uh, it's the much smaller of the two reservoirs, and as I mentioned, it has that variable, variable rule curve depending on the season. And um, like I said, uh, Army Corps operates the facility when it's in the flood control pool. Sonoma Water makes water uh, decisions for releases when it's in the, in the water supply pool. The second um, reservoir is Lake Sonoma. It was completed in 1986. It's the much larger of the two reservoirs. It's located west of uh, the cities of Healdsburg and Cloverdale. Um, when I said, like I said, it's much larger. It has a, um, it has a flat rule curve, but um, a, a water supply pool of 245,000 acre feet. And so we consider that as a, a you know, has multiple years of carryover storage, whereas Lake Mendocino is basically, it needs to fill every year. It doesn't really have enough carryover to get through more than one season. And this is this slide represents kind of what I was discussing about the Potter Valley project and, and the effect of uh, the, the amended FERC license uh, that occurred in 2006. That, that blue line in the figure shows what the transfers, the average annual transfers to the project were um, 
prior to the amendment, and they averaged around 150,000 acre feet. And after that amendment in uh, 2006, transfers of the project have declined to about 60,000 acre feet on average, and in dry years are, are, are generally much lower. And, and, and like I said earlier, the period it really affects is that time frame after March when we're really depending on um, inflows to be able to uh, leverage that additional water supply that's being encroached into the, um, into the flood control pool. And I think this, this, this is really what, um, what exemplifies the issue with the reservoir and also what was going on in the minds of folks that were starting to contemplate the idea of forecast informed reservoir operations. So again, this is that rule curve for the reservoir. And below it right now is, is the um, precipitation for uh, water year uh, 2012. Um, it wasn't a banner year, but um, it was actually slightly below normal. But you just keep in mind the, the distribution of that rainfall through the season. And this bold green line is the actual storage that was observed in, in water year 2012. Um, as you can see, we had some storm events, you know, about half the rainfall uh, fell into early February and then it was, we had a fairly dry period. And you, you can see the reservoir didn't really react to it. And we were coming in to well below the, the, you know, where we could be in the reservoir for water supply. And we were actually getting very concerned uh, about the storage levels and, and what this might mean for, for going into the dry season and having adequate water supply uh, coming into to the summer. Um, however, you can see that in, uh, in um, March, we had these two big atmospheric river events back to back. And you know, it was the right timing that it was able to be stored with the, with the increase in the water supply pool. Now, water year 2013, Again, the cumulative rainfall is almost identical, but the distribution is very different. Almost all the rainfall occurred prior to January, and then it got very dry and we entered into that 20, the, the, you know, 2013, 14, 15 drought. And it had a very different impact on water supply. So you can see the, you know, we had these big AR events in, 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 in December, um, and you can see the storage, this dark blue line, the observed storage, we, um, increased drastically. Um, again, you had another AR event came up, but because of the very rigid operating rules for the reservoir, the Army Corps was obligated to release that water as soon as they could to prepare for the next potential event, even though forecasts may have informed them that there was nothing on the horizon, which there wasn't. Um, so the idea is, what can we do to leverage that water when it comes in the winter and then we see a dry spring. And so that was really the, the, the impetus of, of, of really starting the whole concept of Thero. And so this, this slide is just a timeline of, 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 of the Thero initiative at Lake Mendocino. Steering committee was formed in, uh, in, in, in the summer of 2014, recognizing um, that water that had been released, but, but it was released because of, it, the Corps was obligated to for, um, for dam safety and flood control purposes. Um, a number of workshops occurred annually through the years. Um, two viability, um, viability assessments were, were, were prepared, looking at both um, the feasibility of, uh, did it improve water supply? And also did it not um, increase the risk of flooding by, by, by having that Bureau pool? Both those viability studies were performed using um, um, computer simulations, um, and both of them came to the conclusion that there, there was a tremendous um, improvement for water, rely water supply reliability, but um, it, they also showed an improvement for flood control. And under um, what's referred to as a planned deviation to flood control uh, operations, um, which uh, the steering committee uh, requested by the Army Corps and were approved for both 2019 and 2020, um, those, those, those um, deviations from the flood control manual actually allowed the Corps to create that, that buffer pool, which is about 11,000 acre feet. And along with the other tools and protocols they use for managing the flood control pool, um, use Firo tools to help them make release decisions. In 2019, it was such a wet water year it really showed no water supply improvement. We would have ended up in there anyway because it was just it was such a wet year. 
a number of really large AR events. I don't know if you remember the flooding in late March and early, I mean, early, late February, early March. Um, but in 2020, I'm going to show you a slide. Um, it actually had dramatic water supply improvement. And 2020 was when we started coming into this severe drought we're in right now. Um, as you can see, this is again uh, the, a, diag a figure of Lake Mendocino. You can see the flood control uh, rule curve, the top of the Firo um, uh, buffer pool, and then the black line is observed storage in the reservoir. And we actually came into um, water year 2020. Um, pretty high reservoir levels because how of how much because uh, of, of, of 2019 being a really wet year. Um, some small storm events occurred in in December 2020, which actually brought the reservoir into the buffer pool. Um, another a small AR event occurred in January, which bumped this up more. And then this additional um, um, increase in the reservoir was actually from transfers of water from the Potter Valley project. Uh, discretionary transfers to, uh, for, that pg e was producing hydroelectric power that bumped us all the way to the top. And this resulted in um, the, the reservoir being over 11,000 acre feet higher than it would have, would have been if we hadn't been able to operate under this major deviation. This brown line is the simulated storage uh, using um, a, a res our reservoir operations model showing where we would have been. You can imagine Coming into the drought of 2021, if we hadn't had this additional water, where we'd be right now. Lake Mendocino is currently at about 13,500 acre feet. So the reservoir would be practically drained right now if we hadn't had this additional water coming into the drought. And so just to wrap up, um, you know, the Firo, you know, where we are with Firo right now is we're, we're, we're taking um, those, those, um, uh, feed, uh, viability assessments, and we're now in the process of of um, getting a, a water control manual update that will, will will allow the core to continue using these tools and, and allowing this this flood space. We expect this process to be about three years long. We don't expect it to be one and done. This green this green area is kind of this concept of Bureau two point of building adaptability into the, the, the water control manual update so that it can rec we recognize with advancements in forecasting skills that could we increase this 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 bureau pool even more. It may have other constraints than than the, than the space below it, but you know, are there uh, uh, um, possibilities? And this uh, last slide, um, I just want to mention um, also uh, forecast informed reservoir operations. The Stero Committee for that used to be referred to as the Lake Mendocino uh, uh, Firo Steering Committee. They renamed themselves the Russian River uh, Steering uh, Firo Steering Committee because they've now started this whole process at Lake Sonoma, which shows huge um, possibilities for water supply benefit. And I just want to go quickly over this last slide. Um, this is an exceedance plot um, using 108, 108 years of hydro hydrologic record from 1910 to 2017. And um, each, what, it, what it's representing is water, winter water, kind of the same concept of, of saving that winter water at Lake, Lake Sonoma, but winter water that's available that passes by our um, diversion facilities uh, near, near, near Forestville at Wooler and Mirabel that we could divert in the winter. And each of the, dark, the, the, the dark dots just represent different demand scenarios in our system that would constrain how much, uh, how much water we could move in our system. But really what, what I want you to concentrate, think about is this envelope that it creates. And it shows that there's a huge amount of water that's available. And when I don't know if many of you are familiar with an exceedance plot, but basically, you know, coming over to this 90 percentile, 95 percentile, you get past this. These are representing the extremely dry years. So this last, this last dot over here is probably 1977, um, the last drought that would be incorporated into this analysis. And what it's showing is, you know, up until, you know, the 80th per, uh, percentile, there's, it's almost flat. There's a huge amount of water, 10 or 11,000 acre feet every year that could be skimmed off and used conjunctively through the, in, in the region. So this could be um, um, ASR, um, art, um, you know, uh, um, re, uh, recharge projects to groundwater. This could offset groundwater pumping that's already occurring, you know, that, that so let those groundwater resources rest. It could be, for example, um, Murray Municipal Water District that 
that has its own uh, reservoirs and its, its watershed. If, for example, you know those reservoirs are low, they could lean a little bit heavier on this water until they're sure their reservoirs are going to fill and have water supply security. So this is really one of the places Sonoma Water is looking is how can we leverage winter water? And the first example was through Firo and, and, and at Lake Mendocino, and hopefully we'll, 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 we'll find that it's also feasible with Lake Sonoma, but also other, cons other areas we could use this winter water to, to, leverage, uh, to leverage water, water security. Yeah, that's, that's really exciting. Um, thank you for, for that. And I, we have about 10 minutes. I'd love to open it up for discussion. Uh, Don, don't go anywhere because I have a, a, a cued a question for you. And then um, while he's answering my question, if you all can, if you have projects that you're working on, you have programs that might support uh, this conversation, if you could put it in the chat so that we, that we know that you're there or, and or could follow up. But Don, I wanted to ask you just in the framing of looking at the in economic, environmental and social objectives here, we clearly understand the environmental. Um, can you say one thing uh, with under one minute, what your solutions are bringing to the economic um, aspects of this? And then the second part of my question is I'm going to tap uh, Juan Carlos uh, uh, Solis, and I'm hoping that he can help us frame the social side of these programs, you know, how are we helping to um, support the social uh, communities? And um, so Don, uh, you wanna to touch on the economic side of things for a sec? Yeah, I, do, I can do that really quickly. You know, um, so our region has been very aggressive on, um, on bringing water use, uh, water use efficiency, you know, and that's, Habitat, you know, habit changes that 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 are long lasting. Our region per capita uses is is very low water use compared to many places in California. Um, so, but you know, when as as you become more more water use efficient through landscaping, through um, water efficient appliances, uh, uh, toilets, faucets, when you come into a, a severe drought, it, it it makes it very difficult to make acute water use changes because you've already tightened your belt. You, you just don't have another hole in the belt to, to tighten. And so, I mean, and, 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 and I'm not saying our, our, that there isn't, there isn't still, um, you know, work we can do for water use efficiency. It, 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 there, there's, still, there's still work to do, but it just makes it very difficult. And I think water, you know, looking at these resiliency projects to bring new water to this, you know, to the, to, to, to the region, and having water available for these these acute droughts avoids you know these 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 these, these um, drastic cutbacks, which absolutely have economic impacts. It has econ I mean, Mary Grace is, is shaking her head. It has impacts to her utility because they they're, they 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 aren't collecting the revenues they need to cover their, their expenses. I mean, it, it and, and businesses are impacted. Right. By this. And it's and it's affecting farmers. And then it might be affecting the, the types of crops that they could potentially grow. If there's no water, then those, those crops are going to have to um, pivot to something um, else. Obviously, the fish industry and, um, yeah, I think, you know, just the housing market alone, uh, you, could, you could really tie it to a lot of those economic pieces. So I think the work that you all are doing is um, extremely important. And thank you both for taking the time today to share about your projects. Um, I want to just uh, uh, turn it over to Juan. Is I think he is on, I don't see his photo, but Juan is with uh, Sonoma Water as well. Um, is he on here? Yes, I'm, I'm right here listening. Oh, Go okay. Ahead. Would you can I tap? Can I tap you with? Um, I know you do a lot around water education, so trying to help us frame the the social aspect. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, water resilience kind of lives out and affects the social side of the communities in Sonoma? Yeah, I, I can give you a, a, some information about water education about. Uh, you know, expanding into 
more than that, you know, I, I don't know, it might be out of my expertise, but, but I can tell we have a robust web education program that is now back uh, to in-person instruction for schools where pretty much all the um, all the kids within Sonoma County, at some point we reach out to them through our program. So that's, that's very robust. Uh, we do a lot of uh, community outreach to groups, not only in English, but also in Spanish, trying to reach new audiences. As a matter of fact, I just had a, a you know, a, a session just like today's session in, in all in Spanish where we had, a, you know, a few members attend and we did an English program as well. So, so I think, um, you know, in terms of the drought, in terms of what's going on, I think the community is, is very aware of what's going on. We just had a, what we call a drought drop by where we gave, gave a drought kit with uh, tools to save water, you know, simple things just like a bucket, uh, so you can collect yeah. water and use it back. So, so we've done some outreach of that kind, and so I think the awareness is out there. And as Don said, you know, it's is when you already tighten the belt for a previous dry year, it, you know, it's not easy for people to to go further and and restrict their water use. So that's that's a that's a tough call, but people are doing it. Yeah, um, that's great. I wonder. Um, so I wonder. Wonder, and, and anyone can speak up if you want to just unmute yourself and we only have five minutes left, but I'll put another framing question out. You know, what are the low hanging fruit ideas that we as a group today can collaborate around um, to, to merge the environmental, economic and social part of this um, and also to improve our, our vulnerability, um, our, our vulnerable communities? Um, you know, who are those communities? How are they affected? Um, so I'd love to hear from from the general audience. Are there things that um, you all are doing to kind of help help push those forward? And then the second part is, what, how could we co collaborate further around this? Anyone? Mary Grace, your hand is up, but it might have been from before. No, actually, <laughs> I, I, I'm listening. Oh, good. Saying you'll. Know, the agency's resiliency programs remind me of ADUs for housing stock. Let's let's take infrastructure that we've already largely invested in, disturbances that we've already tolerated, and then maximize what we can get in terms of housing people um, in that already disturbed, already infrastructure rich environment. Um, the agency's resiliency projects are are so much like that. Uh, you know not big capital investments, not large new um, environmental disturbances, but the benefit to all of the community, it, you know, it's, it's just outstanding. Um, and, you know, to the extent that our water supply is reliable, is something we can count on, um, that, that is across the board social benefit for every single person in our community. Yeah, I, I, I agree, yes. I see another hand raised, JW. Yeah, uh, this is uh, Jan. I'm sorry to be late. I, I, had, uh, I had to work with my general manager until just now. But um, I have kind of a pet thing that uh, is not maybe in normally in these kind of discussions, but um, my what I notice uh, is that the way people wash dishes is unbelievably wasteful of water. Uh, people turn on the tap and they leave it on the whole time. Yeah, I've seen that as well. Yes, it's just it's just I mean, on, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm guessing that people are using ten or twenty or thirty times as much water as is necessary. Uh, I was in the uh, the Air Force. Uh, and the Boy Scouts. And, um, you know, it's very simple. You set up a wash bucket and a rinse bucket and a second rinse. And yep. it's like yep. you use a couple gallons to wash an infinite amount of dishes. And I'm sitting here watching my housemate, you know, turn the tap on hot water full on and sit there. Yep. And it just. No, I, I get it. I get it one. And I think that's yawn, something that. Yeah. Yawn. Yawn, I'm sorry. Yeah, and um, I just wonder if there's some kind of citizen education thing we can do is just like wash your dishes efficiently. I think yeah. it would have a big impact. I think that that's something that we can maybe try to incorporate into the education that we just heard about um, with Sonoma water. Um, that Thank you for that um, 
for that feedback. And sorry to be late. Um, Thanks so much for doing this. Yeah. Anyone else want to weigh in with our last minute? Um, we did have quite a few questions and comments in the chat. So uh, it seems like people are preferring okay. it that way. Um, did you want me to read any of those out loud? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay, so um, there's a comment about other nearby regions uh, are more agricultural than this region of California. This person lives in the Central Coast. There's a lot more applications in agriculture of our water down there. Um, another comment, uh, question actually, what would you consider the main reason for Sonoma County's low water use and use efficiency compared to other nearby regions? Um, and I'll just keep reading it. Yes. Takes right. off, right? Um, oh, you want to go for that one, Don? Yeah, you know, the reason is um, almost a decade ago, uh, Sonoma Water and, and the contractors and other regional agencies formed the Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership. And they collectively, um, they pay into that to raise funds for investing, uh, making, you know, cash for grass uh, um, initiatives available you know, changing out toilets, all kinds, all kinds of initiatives that have, have brought our, our region into, um, you know, really, um, really impressive uh, um, reductions in water use. Like I said, and, and there's still, there's still in room for improvement. But when you look at, if you look at our region compared to the state, it's, it's, it's remarkable. I, I don't know if Mary Grace wanted to add something to that. I think Mary Grace had to jump off. Um... And let's do one more question. And then I'll say that um, if folks want to reach out um, with additional questions, let, let me know. Um, and my email is Kristen at ecoshift.com. And then if there are some glaring questions that need to be answered, I can follow up with each of you via e email as well. So one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, this last question. When the water elevation reaches the storage curve at Lake Mendocino, does that mean it's become full for that year? What would the reservoir look like now in present years from 2019 where we had additional water? No, so those that 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 curve represents how much water can be stored for water 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 supply and we can't go above it other than this hero pool we've created during kind of during the um during the during the during the months where where it's been um, brought down for flood control purposes, so we we can't store any water. There is no authorization to store water above and beyond that. Lastly, I thought somewhat it was interesting. Somebody recommends looking into beavers, uh, and there's a big comment about that um, that I thought <laughs> notable. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, last uh, Patty, and then we're going to close out our day today. Hi, I'd like to say another reason I think that um, Sonoma County is so good about watching their water use is it shows the importance of education and creating good habits. Because as a child of the 70s in Marin County, we never got past turning off the water when we brushed our teeth or the toilets. And I think that we're bringing forth north of what we learned. And I think it just goes to continue to teach and these kind of practices. Yeah, that's, that's great feedback. Well, thank you, everyone. This was exciting. And our next one, Carrie, uh, could you give us our next date? We're going to talk about food, which yes, is one of absolutely. my favorites. Yes, um, So I have a whole bunch of links that I'm going to be pasting in the chat right now. And I'll tell you about those. So thank you again for our presenters, our audience members who engaged, and to our moderator, Kristen Cushman. Uh, you can access the recording of today's event at the same place that you registered. Um, our next Building Resilience event is a month from today. So that's Wednesday, November 10th at noon. And as she said, it is about local food systems and disasters. So you can learn more about that um, and the other dozen public events we have with the center at the a, a website that I put in there, cei.sonoma.edu slash calendar. Um, and I wanted to highlight one of the events coming up called Live from the Field, um, Freshwater Invasions. And that's on October 25th. So if there's any professors or high school teachers in the audience, these events are designed specifically to give classes of students 
virtual field experiences and interaction with researchers from around the world. Uh, and they're designed to incorporate into course curriculum. So we have instructor guides, reading materials, suggested assignments all ready for you. Um, but they are welcome to everybody. Um, and they're and really last, fun. They're really fun. Yeah, because you get to see researchers at their field sites at various eco regions around the world all talking together. It's really it's fascinating. Yeah. And this next one, we have someone from Canada, Texas, Ohio. It's a it's a good mix. Um, and then lastly, if you are a faculty member, I just wanted to mention that we're offering research grants for local environmental, economic, and cultural challenges surrounding the complicated intersection of water and homelessness. And that's part of the Rising Waters Initiative. And we have an info session coming up October 15th, just in two days, that we invite you to join. And the link is in the chat for that as well. Um, and then if you have any questions or comments, you want to get involved with us further, I also put my email in there. So you can contact me or Kristen. And, um, yeah, thank and thank you. you again so much for joining us today. And we hope to see you again soon. See you next month. Bye.